I'm also happy to have your phones out as long as you're not plain bejeweled or one of those other <laughs> addictive two dots, I think. So when I play. Um, you can follow me at Jen Lee Moss as well and tweet and use the hashtag. I know that Quest is really encouraging that today and I'm happy to support it. I'm active on Twitter. I like to get the, the messaging across. A lot of our educators in Hero Gen schools also are tweeting what's happening in the classrooms and I think it creates a really good awareness of what's happening um, using social media for good. So I'm here to talk about happiness and some people think, well, what's happiness? It's kind of got a bad brand, you know? Happiness is supposed to be about constant joy and so this Pollyanna concept around it. You go into work and you're not feeling really great and that super chipper person is around you and you're maybe not feeling it. Sometimes that happens. But I think we need to identify what happiness really is. And, and part of that will be me taking you through the journey of my own experiences and what I've learned through science because I have to bring in science. It's so key to getting those folks that I work with on the UN Global Happiness Council. Yes, it is a thing, the UN Global Happiness Council, and I'm a member. What we do is try to bring science and evidence to the concepts of well-being so that people that want to invest in it will do so. Because well-being, as we were just talking at the table, is um, a nice-to-have feeling for most people, but when it comes to economics, it's critical for our performance. So the average person spends 90,000 hours at work in a lifetime. For some of you, that might be highly depressing because so many of us feel like this on Fridays. <laughs> Get me the hell out of here. Researchers, because researchers can quantify anything. I'm a researcher, I can quantify anything. What they have found is that there is an exact time on Friday that we mentally check out, and it's 2.39 p.m. <laughs> 2.39. We mentally check out. Can, Canadians in the summertime, it's probably around 11 that they're starting to think of what Caesar mix that they should use. Should I use the pickle or the celery as my side? So it's a, <laughs> thank you, the pickle. <laughs> I love that. So why do I care though? Why is it important to me that I'm focusing on work? A big part of that is not just because we spend so much time there, that's a big part of it, 70% of our waking hours at work, but when only 13% of the global workforce is actually happy at work, that's a lot of people who are spending their life not well. Because when we don't like going to work, we start to feel sick. It creates um, stress and anxiety. It makes us miserable to be around. It makes others miserable to be um, around. So I'm trying to change that. So my story begins in San Jose in 2009. That's my husband sort of pushing that guy down on the ground. He was playing in the World Cup for Canada. They finally beat the US after 28 years. Yes. They called him the ax. My father watched him play and said, do you really want to marry that guy? And I said, yes. They, he told me when he was playing pro hockey, which he was a pro hockey player and he had concussions and then he said, I think I'm gonna stop playing hockey and go and play lacrosse because it's safer. <laughs> and I'm stupidly, you know, believing him and then he goes to play lacrosse. Well, what happened was in 2009, he contracted West Nile virus, swine flu twice that year, and then as a result, Guillain-Barre syndrome, post-viral illness. He was in his, in our home, in our condo. He tried to call me, he couldn't get in touch with me. He calls his mom. And of course, like any typical hockey mom or lacrosse mom, he says, I'm, you know, can't feel my toes. I can't feel my hands. I'm scared. And she goes, don't call me dummy, call 911. You'll find out that my mother-in-law is at sort of the core of my stories, you know, in therapy. Well, he calls 911. 
The firefighters knock down the doors, and it isn't until I finally get in touch with my husband through doctors and his mother-in-law that I meet him at the hospital, and his major organs are starting to shut down. They're handing me over DNRs. I have to think about what that would mean for us. We have a two and a half year old son, and we're pregnant eight and a half months. Those moments, many of us in the room, I'm sure, have them. You have those things that happen in your life, or you're maybe going through something right now that feels crushing, that feels exhausting, that feels like you can't get through it. And then you're in it, and you do. You somehow get through it. Jim had so many years of psychological fitness training because he's an athlete and he was identified as a top performer very young. So what happened was he got coaching to develop efficacy, resiliency, optimism. He was able to use gratitude to, to figure out what this meant for us as a family because when we said to the doctors, do whatever you can to save his life, they did. They told him, though, that he wasn't going to walk again. And as an athlete that is in four different sports hall of fames and has played in World Cups in two different sports, that could be devastating. But for Jim, he just said, I'm going to tackle this. I'm going to win a gold medal in walking. And he did. He relearned how to brush his teeth. He relearned how to make a meal in a wheelchair, if that's what had to happen. And then he walked out of the hospital after six weeks. A lot of what we went back to in, in trying to define what it was that helped him recover so quickly was he used gratitude constantly. He, was, he read all the research, he asked his fans to give him all the things that he needed to get to try to heal emotionally because he didn't have as much control over his physical health as he could over his, his mindset. He was thankful for the PTs, the OTs, the doctors, the nurses. He was thankful for rice pudding until two weeks in where he wasn't because it's disgusting. And when he was back after he walked out of that hospital holding his son's hand, he came back to help me deliver our baby girl, Olivia. It was, like anyone else, a moment, a catalyst, a milestone. We moved back to Canada and decided to research it. We were grateful for healthcare, that's for sure. And we wanted to understand what was going on. We also realized that Jim wouldn't have a comeback, and that was really hard for him. He thought as he was evolving that that might happen, and there was a whole other moment of having to have resiliency and capacity to find a new journey. A lot of athletes struggle going from being an athlete into the world of work because they are so connected to that identity. Well, what you see here is the first of Jim's research as he went back to go get his PhD, winning the gold medal of life as a chief happiness officer, which he is now. It's a great title. I think every CEO should be a chief happiness officer. Well, this is actually a contagion of happiness. And it started with this Framingham Heart Study that was in Massachusetts. 40,000 people were looking at, um, researchers were looking at social contagions. And they found out that heart health is actually contagious. When they looked at in 2008, these doctors from Harvard and Yale, Christakis and Fowler, thought, well, maybe there's other social contagions, and let's look at happiness. So there's a person in the middle. They took one person and measured 18 people around them, from neighbors to peers at work to family members, and they found that if you have a happy friend living within a mile of you, so when we talk about community today and connection, they have to physically be connecting with you, not texting you, not tweeting, meeting you and talking to you in person. Very important that I'll outline through the rest of the talk. Actually meeting with you. So you're 25% happier if you have a happy friend within a mile. 14% happier if your sibling is close and they're a happy person. Your neighbor, if they're happy, 34% increase in your happiness. And sadly, your spouse only makes you 8% happier. <laughs> Told Jim I was moving in next door. Here's other social contagions. Diabetes, smoking, alcohol consumption, drug use, depression, loneliness. 
so many of these social contagions are ripe with negativity biases because we are still genetically connected to our fight or flight. We still are drawn to negative headlines more than we are positive, and we have to work on that. But happiness has a strong capacity to combat other social contagions. So I'm going to play this video for you here if you want to cue it up, and it's about the contagion of other people on us. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> to maintain his individuality, <laughs> but little by little, <laughs> he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. <laughs> so why do we do that? First of all, we have lazy brains, and uh, we develop heuristics, so patterns, so that we can actually um, be, let our brains be lazy. And a big part of that is we're spending so much time trying to process all these unconscious pieces of information. 11 million pieces of information per second we're actually dealing with in our subconscious. And only we're able to attend to 40 pieces of information. So like the fact that I'm wearing pants, I don't need to be thinking, oh, am I dressed all day? Like, am I dressed? Oh, good, I'm dressed. Oh, am I dressed? Oh, I'm not naked, thank God. You don't have to deal with that all day because your subconscious is just dealing with it as well. So if we can create these patterns, if we can actually create, turn our habits into um, actually sustained subconscious behaviors, then that allows us to be able to just let our, our brain rest. And that's why we, we do that. That's also why we mimic other people because it's part of our DNA to be part of a tribe. We're genetically predisposed to want to connect with other people because that's what keeps us psychologically safe. And that's our unconscious constantly talking to us in the back of our brains and making us want to reach out. And when we don't, we feel isolated and lonely. These are the, our determinants of happiness. So there's nature nurture, of course, like anything else. But there's a piece that is highly learned that's intentional activity where we can work out the brain like a psychological fitness regime. And then there's this 10% that all of society says is the most important part of our happiness, which is the new shoes, the new clothes, the status, the, you know, the new car. Those are the things that we're told are supposed to be so important to us, and yet when we attain them, they don't actually give us long-term happiness, so then we have to keep reaching for more and needing more. And this will really depress you, because as a happiness speaker, I love to make people feel very sad. This is our journey of happiness in our life. Right here, if you're between the ages of like 30 to 60, you're at a low point. Good news, everyone's on their way up. So one of the things that I like to do through my talks is give us moments of pause. And this is one of the ways that I suggest for people, because I don't just work with the um, folks in education. A big part of what I do is work at a policy level and at a kind of a global level with private industry, with public um, industry. And then I work with a lot of school boards to try to get them to think of being more like corporate. And I know that sounds really strange, and you're probably thinking, why the heck would I want to do that? But one of the things that we have to think about is retention and attraction of new t talent and keeping this younger workforce engaged in 
schools and being teachers and being educators and wanting to be in the education industry. And when you're competing with perks from Google and, and you're competing for talent with folks at Twitter and other places that are highly attractive for these young people, we're finding that we're losing staff and losing that attraction of staff. So I've been suggesting to use this tool as a way to start staff meetings. And I'm going to share this with you now. Oh, you can play the video. We're going to play a game that uh, you requested, actually. OK. So one Thanksgiving, I was at my Aunt Camille's house, right? And she pulls out this game using these dental things <laughs> that uh, we play on this show as well. And it was the best. Hi, Aunt Camille. Love you. It was the best time I've ever had in my entire life. And I love it, too. So I've never played show it. her how to put that mm. in her mouth. The big part goes on the inside. OK, ready? Yeah. So squeeze. And then you're going to give me a sentence one at a time. <laughs> Good. All right. All right. <laughs> Bean bag puffers. Oh, oh I'm so very oh, close. Okay, so <laughs> why would I suggest that you would use that in a staff meeting? A, because we have this whole thing that you need to be serious to be taken seriously. And that is so not true. We have found through all of our research that you can have fun, you can laugh, and you're actually considered to be a more trusted leader if you let your guard down and put a whole bunch of people into a room and completely embarrass them, that is the best way to get over your own ego and stress, and it makes you laugh, plus we need endorphins. The problem is, is we're too stressed out. We're not spending enough time laughing. We have issues like teacher shortage. There's 84.3 million teachers in the world, and 80% of teachers are considering leaving their profession in the next five years. 1 billion to 2.2 billion in attrition costs yearly. Over 20% of teachers will leave the profession within five years. We must recruit 69 million new teachers to reach the 2030 education goals. 69 million new teachers. Why are teachers leaving? In OECD countries, Canada is included, lack of ability to recruit young people to the profession and burnout. In developing countries, it's status. Teachers are just not looked at as important in parts of the world that needs to change. We need to look at economic reasons why they are, and that's not happening. Canadian teachers are among the top paid worldwide study fines, so that's good, but they aren't even in the top 10 as far as it, it comes to well-being and health. They're burning out at a high rate. So there's something happening there. They're maybe getting paid well. The thing about pay versus purpose is that Canadian teachers have a high level of purpose. And when you start to look at proximity to purpose, teachers are so engaged. And this is where I talk about engagement as not a false measure, but an incomplete measure when we look at education staff. Because the closer an employee is, so a teacher or a principal or vice principal or anyone at ECE, anyone in the schools, closer they are to their student, the higher level of engagement they show in measurement, but they could be extremely burnt out, stressed out, they have compassion fatigue, as some of your other speakers have been talking about. When you look at engagement inside of the corporate staff at the board, they align. So their engagement levels align with their levels of stress. So we look at 
we can look at that as a measure of stress inside of the corporate environment, but we can't look at that when those folks on the front line are so connected to the end stakeholder, which is the student, and they burn out their own health over actually leaving the job. And it doesn't just happen at work. The problem is, is that we're seeing it happen outside of work. So this is a heat map of all the things that are causing stress for teachers here, and they're mostly in culture drivers, which is so interesting. We think that stress is happening sort of in other places, that it's about school violence, which is really important discussion. We should talk about that. But it often is happening just in communication breakdowns. It's happening in trust. It's culture issues that are impacting student health. This is where you see it. And what happens is, as a byproduct, hope and resiliency start to plummet. So you lose trust in communication, upward feedback is a problem, and then hope, resiliency starts to fall off the map. You see it in healthy cultures, obviously. You know, there's engagement. But look at engagement. Perfectly, beautifully colored, bright yellow. If you were just looking at engagement as a measure to find out if your staff were healthy, you wouldn't actually see that they're suffering in depletion of hope and resiliency. So something that definitely needs to be changed. We start to look at the environmental effects too. What we find too is that people are working this 24-7 lifestyle. Some of the staff that we've been working with say, there's no boundaries on email communication anymore. I don't know how I feel when a parent emails me and expects for me to respond by that evening. It's very stressful for me. So we've started these hacks, you know, putting out of offices on that say I won't be able to respond to your email to the morning. They're these simple solutions but offer complex benefits. So it's about thinking about what's happening outside external conditions and internal conditions. Political changes, control of your at and autonomy inside of your classrooms. What we need to do is support a framework promotes behaviors that positively impact school culture and drive staff and student well-being because that actually creates safe and inclusive environments for students. As a school administrator, false, it is my job to make staff and teachers healthier at my school. No, I'm responsible to create and protect the conditions where well-being can flourish. And that means that intention piece when you talk about commitments, it's our responsibility too as individuals to think I could be stressed at work, but I could also be stressed at home. I could be part of a sandwich generation. I'm a, parents are actually on that graph. Parents are the ones that are the most unhappy. How many of you are parents here? So I am a parent too. And what really we should be saying is that we're not our most unhappy. We're just at the most volatile time in our entire lives. You look at your child and they're sleeping so peacefully and you're like, I'm so happy. And then they wake up totally different experience. So here is where we have intention to understand that our, our administrators and our, our school staff and our leaders need to create conditions of well-being, but aren't we also responsible for our own happiness too? We need to work at that. We need to take time. There's things that are coming at us though, the breaking news disorder. How many of you feel like there's a lot of breaking news and it's increased? It has 20 times in the last five years. And it's exponentially increased in the last two. And this isn't a political dig. However, you should see my tweets and you'll see how I feel about that. Overcuration is an issue too. So parents are feeling responsible for their children being competitive to the point where we're t starting to take away their childhood. And there's an expectation and a pressure on staff to try to meet those demands. And really the, what the science says is we're supposed to be giving more of our students time to play and just be themselves because this is a very singular moment in their lifetime. And forcing them to have to play multiple instruments and learning every language to be competitive isn't necessarily what is going to make them the most successful. Actually, social emotional intelligence is really what we need to be building in them and the conditions to be able to explore what it is that makes them their happiest. And also as a parent, you know, I don't want to put kale in their lunch every single day. Like, there's so much pressure to have these perfect children. 
There's also technology. So technology isn't actually the big bad beast in the room. We are just using technology and replacing relationships versus augmenting them. And that's the thing. We need to still have proximal connections. When we talk about connections, that's what we still need to have, is augmenting our relationships with technology, not replacing them. We also have to understand the speed in which our brain is trying to adapt to that technology. 204 million emails sent a minute. And this is about a year old, so this is probably even, we're blowing through this. 220,000, um, 27,000 tweets is actually now 350,000 tweets a minute. 416,000 swipes on Tinder. That's a lot of stuff going on there. The thing about, and the, the reason why I include that, the reason for this acknowledgement of what, t you know, what Tinder represents, it really is just that our way of relating and forming relationships has dramatically changed over the last five years. So people are adjusting. If our brain still has a genetic hangover from fight or flight because we're worried our saber-toothed tigers were going to eat our food, how is our brain catching up to that? It's not. It's just frazzled. Loneliness is also a problem. I know there's some folks here that have been talking about loneliness. The UK appointed a minister of loneliness, which is so British. I, <laughs> like, why not the minister of happiness? Like, let's lead into what we want to be versus stay. Anyways, I do some work with them, so I feel like I'm allowed, but um, the hero generation is really what we're trying to develop. We talk about iGen. Gen Z, you know, let's call them the hero generation so they can live up to something. Let's stop putting, you know, alphabets, you know, al let's stop alphabetizing the future generation. Let's call them heroes. And that means hope, efficacy, resilient, and optimistic kids. That it can be our next generation. Hope, efficacy, resilience, optimism, gratitude, empathy, mindfulness. This is actually empirically proven to increase our performance, our healthiness, our happiness, our lifespan. If we can build up these psychological traits, then we can get to the place of PERMA, which is what happy people are defined at. We're positive, they're engaged, they have healthy relationships, they have meaning, and they feel a sense of accomplishment. That's PERMA. This is how we get there. That's the, the work that we have to do to get there, working on that every day. We started this by using little children as psychological experiments, which you do as researchers. We do this in our own family all the time, our poor children. Wyatt was five. We were just going into this research around social contagion, and we were looking at gratitude specifically and how cool gratitude is because it actually um, it works in the same center of the brain as language. So you can develop fluency in it, and you have to immerse yourself in it, and then what happens is you start to shift your neural wiring, and then you move from actually cognitively translating from your mother tongue into the other language, but you start thinking in that language. That's what immersion is supposed to do. So you stop thinking in you know, English and then translating in French, you actually start thinking in French. Same thing with gratitude. Same thing actually with mind, mindfulness, empathy. You go from practicing empathy to being empaths. With gratitude, so why it's around the table, we're saying, why, you know, what, are you, what made you smile today? We started to ask him that at dinner time. And at first it was like all the stuff around the table. Unfortunately, I wish it was kale. It was chicken nuggets and french fries because we're eating McDonald's. So I have to embarrassingly tell this story over and over again. Well, he says, oh, like food or whatever's in front of me. He did that for several weeks. And then when he started to realize that we were serious about him reporting back to us at dinner time, he started to recognize throughout the day what he was grateful for. And one day at dinner, he just recited a whole bunch of stuff. When I walked down the street and I got a hug from my friend and when I got extra computer time, and it was really cool when this happened with my friend who stood up for another friend on the playground. So he's reciting all of this stuff off. His brain was starting to catalog from the start of the day the things that were positive that he was witnessing. And what that does is it wasn't, it was that he was replacing those acknowledgments of what was negative. So he, was, he, was, he stopped doing that. And then he also was being mindful by paying attention to things that were positive. His neural wiring was starting to trick itself into understanding that he had something to report to. This is where gratitude journals and the science of gratitude journals and why they matter. Because you know at the end of the day you're going to report to that journal. 
So you start to pay attention in the day to what's happening. We, in that classroom assessment, we worked with University of um, Wilfrid Laurier University, and we tracked 21 days of gratitude, engagement with JK and SKs. And at the end, we found sense of self increased, um, ability to communicate with others increased, love of school increased by 32% in those JKs in June, which is hard. You just want to get outside and be done with school. And then also um, empathy towards others change. So when I talk about simple actions and complex benefits, important to know you can't think that it's silly to do the, the work. Hope is really important when we start talking about hope. It's not wishful thinking. Hope is about pathways and agencies and about goal setting. One of the ways that you can develop cognitive hope is by making your bed. It um, really isn't just about making your bed. It is about accomplishing one small task at the start of your day to make you believe that you can accomplish more goals. For young people, it's really important because if you just recognize that they've accomplished something, then they will be able to go on to predict that they will have a more productive day. There's hope in the brain. There's scientists in China that are now looking at where we actually see hope, we filter it, and why it's so much part of our humanity, because we filter it through the orbital frontal cortex, which means that we see hope, we believe in it. And when you start to look at whether a student is going to have success, they actually analyzed across a meta-study, tens of thousands of students, and they gave them a hope, 12-question hope survey. And they compared that to their ACT entrance exams, SATs, um, LSATs for law school. And that 12-question HOPE survey was a better predictor if they would graduate, graduate with high marks, and have um, a like, more likely chance of getting hired upon graduation than any of those other tests. HOPE is a huge part of what we need to build so that we can have academic success and we can be success. So I always say make a wow goal within one week. We work with Lululemon, and what we've learned working with them is that they have really big goals. Um, they call them BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. These BHAGs are part of their whole culture, and they live up to them. Their daily goals, their wow goals within one week goals, and they have these frames that they post at everyone's desk, and they have five-year goals, and everything is always focusing on that goal. And that's hope building. Efficacy is also really important. We need to believe that we can never give up. Self-efficacy for in education is really important because we don't always see the results of our efforts. We have to believe that what we're doing every day actually matters and that we're contri cri contributing. I'm going to play this video quickly around self-efficacy and why we need to support this, not just in creating a culture of try inside of our staff in education and in the industry, but also for our students. You can play the video. Hopefully. Why do we think that's important? Because we need to allow people to fall down and have a culture of try so that they continue to feel like they're learning. You know, Google has this great thing once a month. They have these people on their big call and they're the, called the, the failure group. And it's the project that just got canceled. And they throw a big, you know, party and they congratulate them because it's about celebrating that you tried and you learned and we often are right now creating these resi um, sort of fragile young adults because we're not allowing them to express their own resiliency and learn from falling down and scraping their knees. 
Thank you. Agreed. So one of the other things, and I talk about gratitude, I call it the gateway drug to happiness. And it's because it actually gives the same sort of endorphins as those bad habits we build up. It creates the same sort of chemical rush, so it's the easiest habit to build. Dr. Emmons, Science of Gratitude, he wrote a book called Thanks. It's great research. I would highly recommend reading it. He brought 192 participants together over 10 weeks and had them write down either what they were happy about, with their gratitudes. He had them write down what they were, um, that hassled them. So basically they got to complain uh, on a paper every, uh, every week at the end of the week and then they had the neutral condition. So they just wrote down, you know, clean my closet. Well, I guess for some people that might be a hassle, but what he found after those 10 weeks is that, you know, what you, we would predict, those folks that practice gratitude, stronger immune systems, lower blood pressure, and he looked at 40 different health measures and found that people that were practicing gratitude were much healthier. But what he didn't realize that he was gonna find in the findings was that people that were complaining were actually starting to complain of, of illness. They were getting sicker, their relationships were suffering, their sleep was suffering. So it really does make a difference when you can practice that. And how do you do that? It's so simple, simple actions. Put a thank you note on someone's desk. Send a short email or text praising someone and I want you to do that right now. I want you to pull out your phones. How many of you have phones here? Rhetorical. <laughs> Send a short email right now, or a text, or WhatsApp, or a Facebook post, or tweet. Whatever you want, just send a quick note. And I'm not even going to give you time to do it. I'm going to talk over you while you do it because the whole point is that it should really take 20 seconds. It should take 20 seconds. If you don't have your phones, write a note on the paper in front of you and pass it to someone across the table. And I'll tell you a quick story while you're doing this. Every single talk I do, and it's really funny because I often do talks in the morning, someone writes a really effusive note to their spouse, and then they get back. Have you been drinking? <laughs> Are you drunk? So A, there's a bunch of lessons there. Why would they expect them to be drunk that early in the morning? B, they aren't, and maybe most importantly, they don't thank each other enough. We need to do that more. We need to create habits of thanking each other. We don't. And in the workplace, we're terrible at it. And it could be so simple. In a bunch of our schools, what we've done is we've had an, um, gratitude for the custodian. And so the whole day is spent with students taking sticky notes and teachers taking sticky notes, staff writing down what they're grateful for about having a clean school or having the care that they have of their schoolyard. And they fill the custodian's doors with sticky notes about what they're grateful for. Do you know how meaningful that is? We've had an entire university go and completely fill the president of Laurier, Max Mesmer's entire office with sticky notes to say thank you for being able to be educated at Laurier. Some of the things that you read are like the most incredible things. So gratitude can be done in a very easy way and you can be practicing it all the time. Resiliency, I'm gonna let Dr. Tversky describe resiliency. He does it better than I do. Video. Do you have to play the video? <laughs> resiliency. There's something I want to tell you about. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the stress and how we have to look at stress, okay? And I think it's an important thing because uh, many people have told me from my lectures it's the one thing they remember. Okay? Turn it up. I was sitting in a dentist's office and looked at an article that said, how do lobsters grow? Well, I don't care how lobsters grow, but I was interested in it. And it points out that a lobster is a soft, mushy animal that lives inside of a rigid shell. That rigid shell does not expand. Well, how can the lobster grow? Well, as the lobster grows, that shell becomes very confining. Right? And the, kind of the lobster feels itself under pressure and uncomfortable. It goes under a rock formation to protect itself from predatory fish, casts off the shell, and produces a new one. Well, eventually, that shell becomes very uncomfortable as it grows, right? Back under the rocks. Good. And the lobster repeats this numerous times. The stimulus for the lobster to be able to grow is that it feels uncomfortable. 
right? Now, if lobsters had doctors, they would never grow because as soon as the lobster feels uncomfortable, goes to the doctor, gets a Valium, gets a Percocet, feels fine, never gets off its shell. So I think that we have to realize is that we have to realize that times of stress are also times that are signals for growth. And if we use adversity properly, we can grow through adversity. Love that. Yes. So many of us, I'm sure, and we still face it, have these terrifying fears. I was actually a person who was absolutely terrified of public speaking. I was the one that thought I would rather, yeah, I would choose death over public speaking. My husband used to tease me because there was one time where I got asked in the middle of the street, I think it was you know, the Leafs playoffs. Uh, maybe, I don't know if that's even true because I don't know if they've ever made the playoffs. <sighs> Sorry. So, so they stopped me as I was walking down the street and Jim said I literally looked at, I just like, oh, it was like word salad. No one understood what I was saying. I was so nervous, even just putting a mic in front of me. I worked on Obama's campaign and so much of what I would do was to just set other people up with ways to communicate and be leaders, but I was terrified myself to go and do that. And then I got asked, asked to do TED X Women. And it was a thing that I couldn't turn down because it was so important and powerful for me to be able to share my side of the story. You know, how it felt like me, for me to be a caregiver in that role with Jim and how terrifying it was for me as a mother and a wife to go through that. So I decided I was gonna tackle it and I practiced as much as I possibly could. I was probably awake for three weeks before, terrified. I went in that day almost incapable of speaking. I had to go into the bathroom and do one of those, you're good enough, gosh darn it, people like you. I just do a speak to, speech to myself in the mirror. I was so scared. And then I had this moment where I walked out and I thought, you're going to miss this. You're going to miss this opportunity to do what you always wanted to do because your fears are eating you alive. And I did power pose. I said, you're going you're gonna to do this. And I went out there and I loved it. I loved it. People wanted me to succeed. They were cheering me on. They were crying with me as I finally shared my story for the first time. And here I am six years later, and it's my calling. It's my passion. And if I hadn't have done that uncomfortable removal of the lobster shell, if I'd taken a Percocet or a Valium, I would not have been present in that moment to feel the fear, to face it, and to make it part of who I am now today. Optimism, who's more risky in this picture? Elephant or the, the monkey? The thing with optimism and optimistic leaders is that they are okay to put their trust in others too. And so often we look at leaders in this dictatorial way where they have to be prescribing everything to you. But really good leaders risk with each other, they share with each other, and that's what we need to do as really good leaders is, is put ourselves in the hands of another person, even if it's as terrifying as this elephant jumping into the arms of the monkey. We need to create habits. One of the habits is set a calendar reminder every Friday, that's what I do, 2.39 p.m. Make sure you set a calendar reminder to say thank you to someone. Only 29% of people thank their peers. That's a self-portrait. I'm there here. What the hell is that? Oh, it's just my mind. One of the reasons why we want to create a more mindful environment, not just among staff, but for our students too, is that mindfulness actually creates emotional regulation. The more that we can listen to what I listen to, three things that I hear, this is an activity you can use, three things I hear, sometimes it's just one thing I hear, where I take one minute to listen to this. Silence. If we can take a minute or two minutes to just li let the back of our brain practice talking to the front of our brain, then what we can do is create emotional regulation. So when people meet you, 
you can meet them where they're at. I noticed that awesome tweet up there about the golden, golden rule. I wrote an article about that for HBR, about two uh, golden rule 2.0, and it's the idea about meeting people where they're at. Don't do unto others as they would have done unto you. Do unto others as they would have done unto them. It's really important for us to be thinking about how we can meet people where they are. And we can't do that if we are meeting chaos with chaos. If we have emotional regulation, we can manage the relationship in the way that it's better suited and as the adult. And if we can be the adult in the room with another adult, that's the best case scenario. And mindfulness does that. It allows us to be able to better handle stress and our primal responses have space in between our rational responses. And then again, this is our gratitude wall and I'm gonna play this quick video for you of our world record attempt, which we succeeded. We will be in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most amount of gratitude collected in eight hours. We had students from all around the community come in and say that they're grateful for air. Teachers writing grateful for being able to teach. Mayors coming in and grateful for their city. But some of the young people wrote things like, grateful that my mom got out of jail. Grateful for having foster parents because without foster parents, kids like me would be in bad hands. When you read that, and as an educator, you create an intimacy with another child that helps you be able to create empathy for them, to understand why they might be acting out. And other students might be able to understand that too. And there's so many great examples of that. And just give yourself a break. One of the things that I like to say is be a hero. And I'm going to be finishing up here in a second. But I want to sort of finish with this story of just my husband and how he was relearning to walk. And he was struggling and he refused to use a bedpan. He would walk the ten, actually would crawl to the bathroom because he was, he needed to just feel like he could accomplish it. And so he would drag himself across the floor. And in the morning, he had this nurse that he heard arguing out with uh, other staff outside and she was stressed out and she came in and she met him and he's on the floor and she's frustrated because she's got other things to do. And she's saying to him, come on, you better get used to this. It's gonna be like this for a really long time. He was gutted. It was really debilitating and it was hard to motivate. And then what happened was in the evening, after he had spent the day feeling badly, in the evening he goes, to try the same move again to the bathroom and he's moving, he's crawling. And he looks up at the nurse that comes in who he heard laughing outside, she comes in, she sees him on the ground and he looks up at her humiliated, guilty. He feels bad that she's wasting his time on him. And she says, don't you worry about it, sweetheart. You'll be back on your feet in no time. And Jim realized that that was the moment and this was several years later, that was the moment that he realized that that nurse had been the catalyst to give him the motivation to walk out of that hospital because she believed in him and her narrative impacted him so much that he wrote her a letter to say thank you because you were the difference for me in getting that mindset. It, and we can all be a hero when we come into work. And don't forget to laugh. And this is the last video before I go, but I just want to leave you with this. You can cue the video. Ready? Yeah. Clap, clap, clap your hands. Thank you.